Okay. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the What is Money show. I'm sitting down today with Mr. Santiago Velez, who is the co founder of Block Digital. And this has been a long time coming. So I appreciate you coming on the show today. Robert, you're, you're, I told, as I told you off camera, you're, you're one of my idols, a big uh, shaper of my thought process. So I'm like super excited to be here. Thanks. I'm honored to have you here as well. And thank you so much for that. Um, so let's just jump in the deep end. Um, how, what is money to you, Santiago? <laughs> like the most convenient and beautiful lie we could ever tell each other. That, that's how I would phrase it. <laughs> um, money, I think, is just a, a super interesting social contract. It's like a abstraction that uh, just facilitates so many things for us, makes life mm -hmm. efficient. Um, and it does mean purchasing power, which is kind of one of the things that I've taken from so many of your talks. Um, and I think it's a... Uh, a huge responsibility for who the caretaker of that uh, of, of money is in a society. Uh, and I think that it's one of the things that's been abused um, in, in that, uh, that role. Uh, so to me, listening to a lot of your interviews, um, what's become apparent is how desperate we are in need of a better lie, if you will, a better abstraction right. um, to, uh, to a more responsible one and one that uh, creates more opportunity. So that, that's money for me. And, and honestly, I, um, I didn't have a sense of money until my early 40s. Um, I, had, uh, I thought of money as something to just go and make so yep. that I could buy stuff uh, and maybe retire with. Uh, but it was a very uh, superficial understanding of it. And I think um, I would call it value. And I, I, for me, value is something that was denied me uh, as a child. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily maliciously, but just you grow up in a society and you're conditioned to express value in a certain way. Um, and you take it for granted as something that's always been true, always existed, and there is no alternative. Uh, but I, my eyes are, are open. Uh, so sorry for the long expression, but that, no. that's how I see it. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. That's, um, you know, the idea of money. I, I like how you put that actually as a, as a lie, right? Because it is, it's a useful fiction. Um, and at the surface level, this may sound like something that's bad in some way but indeed um as i've touched on a few times in the show that our ability to construct these useful fictions and organize ourselves within them is what makes it's what separates human from animal and what makes human or homo, homo sapien if you will dominant in the world and you know i say sapien specifically because that's actually <laughs> the thesis of the book sapiens by yuval harari it's like we can cooperate flexibly in large numbers the way no other species can through this telling and believing of stories or useful fictions. And that's why we, we run the world, right? We're at the top of the food chain for that very reason. You touched on something interesting though. So clearly the, the name of the show, what is money? It opens this, I consider this kind of like the gateway to the rabbit hole, but you went straight to one of the next questions, which I think is, you know, equally, if not more important, which is value. Like this is a very nebulous term for a lot of people. So if you don't mind going further into the deep end, how would you define value? So value to me is uh, something that allows me to express my will into the world, um, both geographically and over time um, beyond my kind of my, my own physical body. So I might value, um, you know, uh, my car. Okay. Uh, why? Because my car allows me to go to wherever I want. So geographically, it gives me a power to drive around and, and see things or do things that I might not otherwise, if I had to walk. Mm -hmm. So I assign it a value. Um, if, if I have a different model car, uh, it may be more than transportation value. Maybe I'm socially signaling because I'm driving a nice fancy car. Uh, so to me, value starts with what, what does it give me 
the ability to do and express out into the world beyond my physical body um, and geographically, like I said, and through time. So, um, you know, purchasing power is one kind of attribute of value, uh, but also the ability to um, see my will exerted into the universe, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, it it can take so many different forms. Now, how would you distill that down to like um, the value I see in relationships, you know, maybe with family members? Uh, That's much more difficult to quantify, but obviously we all seek um, some of these other values to express them with our our families, for example, Mm -hmm. maybe security, love, um, uh, relationships, whatever that is. we seek value out in, in the real world so that we can increase our, our value and that of our family. And then I think that extends out into our community, our nation, and then ultimately the world. Um, and so I look for things that connect those, those things. Yeah. Well said. Um, one of the kind of rough definitions, cause this is, this is another one of those terms that has a ton of meaning and definitions and angles, but one of the, short definitions I give for value is that it's relevance to your goal directed action. So whatever goal you're in pursuit of, if something accelerates you toward achieving that goal or that aim, it's valuable. And if it, if it's not relevant to that course of goal directed action, it's value less, right? It doesn't have any value to you. Um, and if it blocks you, then it's actually destructive to value, right? It's, it's an impediment of some kind. So I think that's a great, great example you gave there with the car, but to your further point, it's not siloed to one domain, right? It's not just this thing gets me faster across space, or this thing does something for me across time. There's also like the sentimental dimension with family and, you know, love and all of these things. So That's a whole rabbit hole too. I I love that one. Um, I I do want to drill into something you said there though. So the power to express your willpower. Well, okay. The ability to express your willpower into the world. We'd say that's kind of a rough uh, approximation of value, which I really like. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately because Clearly, physical power is very important, right? Like the the case of the car giving you this physical power to move across space faster than you otherwise could. Um, But there's this, so that's important. That's like what the reason we have economics to a large extent is to increase, uh, you know, our productivity, I guess you could say, which is the ability to convert our willpower into physical power of some kind. But the problem with this is that we also simultaneously have to check ourselves or defend ourselves against the unwanted imposition of others' willpower onto us, right? This is like the reason you would hold gold, for instance, historically, is because no one could inflate it, right? No one could increase the supply. So this was a defense mechanism against the willpower of others. So there's like this balancing act we're trying to maintain. It's like, how do we manifest more of our willpower into physical power in the world through capital and you know things like that, capital and trade? But simultaneously, how do we protect ourselves from the arbitrary willpower of others? So what, I mean, that's an interesting, I'm just thinking out loud, but I'd love to hear. Yeah, that, that, that's like the, that. that's the root of the social contract. That's the root of all of our human endeavors is the, the trade-off between self and other mm-hmm. is that um, at, at what level do you have to accept or compromise uh, your will to someone else's will? And what are the trade-offs? Um, I think it's not a static answer. It's depending on the context. There, there's always trade-offs. In some cases, I may defer to the will of others. For example, if um, uh, I entered into a contractual arrangement with someone and I was in the wrong, um, a judge would would uh, would decide that I was in the wrong and I may have to pay compensation to that party. Um, in that case, I would default to the, someone else's will, which is the judge, which is imbued supposedly uh, by the state. Um, if I didn't think that was fair, I could exit up, right? I could, you can commit suicide, you can leave to another country, you can go into exile. There are things that you can do that are drastic, but um, 
you at some point at the end of the day, all you really have true power over, I guess, is yourself. Um, if if you have to exist in a in a context of a disbalance between your will and other people's will, then you have to entertain the idea of um, you know a common set of law, maybe, or the state, or some agreement of consensus rules. Uh, for example, like in, in Bitcoin, um, you you have to accept something other than maybe what you personally conceptualized. Uh, so the the reason I like um, things like Bitcoin is because I can I have the power to choose um, which set of rules I want to participate in. It's not compelled. Uh, and as I said earlier in the discussion, I felt like something was denied me as a child um, by that value expression being imposed on me in the sense of currency. Um, and that violation didn't become apparent to me until I started learning about how money is instantiated and how it's used in the economy. Uh, that that's a violation, right? So now, I, it, to me, it's uh, more about how do I um, opt into networks or or forms of value expression that are more beneficial to me, allow me to exert more of my will into the world, as you mm -hmm. as, as you said, and um, but without necessarily violating someone else's uh, rights or will. Mm -hmm. And I, that's where I think markets have such an important role to play, because markets to me are. Kind of the efficient distillation of that uh, that process, that ongoing process between my will and everyone else's, and you know, I, for example, I could go instantiate a, a fork of Bitcoin tomorrow. Doesn't matter. Nobody, my will is it is completely irrelevant that I did that uh, because nobody else would recognize that fork. It's mm -hmm. not the original, and uh, maybe mine has sixty million supply in it. Nobody would adopt that. I can't force anyone else to accept that those rules of consensus. Maybe I could convince a few and, and trick them into it, uh, but there's just no way that would happen. And so that, that's just kind of this uh, programmatic way of this balance between my will and, and the will of everyone else. So that, that, that's one of the things that compelled me to, to uh, this space. Yeah, no, it's, it's well said. I, I have said... And I, I mean, I heard this somewhere, so I'm not, I don't take original claim on any of these ideas that I'm purveying, but um, that the sole human right is choice ultimately, right? There's, uh, and this kind of gets to that. There's the book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. He talks about the final human freedom being that gap between our external circumstances and our internal response like we always get to choose our response um i mean and that's one maybe framing for this term responsibility right that you actually have the ability to respond and no one can take that away from you right we can you can be tortured you can be you know fear induced or threatened and all of these things but ultimately you do have a choice in how you're going to respond to those circumstances no matter what they are um but i really like this this is kind of a new connection I'm drawing here, thinking out loud with you, is that the purchasing power of money then is, is you know, we're all trading in the world. We're becoming more productive by being interdependent instead of operating in isolation. And then money kind of emerges to the surface. And what, what defines money is, as you said, purchasing power. But it's like, okay, what is purchasing power? It's really just like a call option on the willpower of others, right? So if you, in a hard, let's say an honest money world, free of central banking, then you would basically be rendering services to the market, right? So you'd be applying your willpower to satisfy the wants of others, right? Based on their buying and selling patterns. And then you would be rewarded for successful ventures in purchasing power, you would, you would accumulate more purchasing power and money, which then lets you turn around and use that purchasing power to claim, to call on the willpower of others, right? So it's a really, and that is the crux of it, right? That is, this is great because this blows apart statism, this blows apart democracy. It's like, it's all about the marketplace ultimately. That's how we reconcile this, uh, Ineradicable tension between the individual and group, 
the individual's willpower and the configuration of the group willpower, if you will. Hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. It's it's um, it's the best kept secret uh, in in uh, you know, um, it's the best kept secret that governments have is that that they are uh, the facilitators of that. Uh, uh, liquidity that allows us all to transact with one another. Yes. Uh, and we, as custodians of that responsibility, they should be representing us um, so that that balance is respected. Um, and unfortunately, though, in hindsight, it looks like that they have not been doing that. And I think that's because when you give a small group of individuals, regardless of who they are, a disproportionate amount of power over others, eventually the behavioral incentives misalign. Mm -hmm. And so you get bad behaviors and those bad behaviors ultimately lead to the detriment of those that are not properly um, represented. So I think what we have is the, the, the outcome of a lot of misaligned incentives where too few have been imbued with too much power and responsibility and they're no longer capable of even representing the majority. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that that's it's it's painfully apparent. Whereas in a in a free market system, like you pointed out, um, they're bound by it. There's only so much they could do without this alternative existing. Uh, it's it's one of the reasons why Bitcoin is so compelling to so many people because it's an opt out of either their local jurisdictional abuses or writ large the dollar. Mm -hmm. um, it's a way to put handcuffs or, or at least restraints on monetary power because ultimately there those excesses mean more growth for the Bitcoin network. Mm -hmm. I actually look at um, digital asset networks in general just like I do fiat networks. I, I feel uh, fiat is a natural consensus of a geographically derived consensus. you know you got a nation and they have their currency or you know the EU. But they geographically determine consensus rules, mm -hmm. uh, and they're just networks, right? And and their networks have to compete now. Uh, their abstractions have to compete on the internet. The internet mm -hmm. is the general agnostic network to all sub networks, uh, including fiat money, including you know, tokenized items like NFTs, including mm -hmm. uh, cryptocurrencies. So they now have to compete on this level playing field, where if they are not aligned with the um, benefits of their constituents, be they geographically or by participation, um, that that value and purchasing power will flow somewhere else. So it, it's the, the internet becomes a natural place for this co competitive framework to instill discipline. Mm. That discipline hasn't existed prior to because we didn't have a way. Like if I I was born in Colombia, and we don't have a world's reserve currency in Colombia. So um, purchasing power, you know, I used to send a remittance to family years ago that for every dollar I might get, they might get 2000 pesos. Um, now I send it and they may get 4,000 uh, because their purchasing power uh, compared to the dollar has gone down. It's very, it's very hard for them. So all of a sudden, now you have a way where they can um, opt out. If they don't like how their government is managing their purchasing power, which is what they do, mm -hmm. they have a way through the internet to opt out to a completely different currency. And, and that that is like the most amazing superpower I think I could have ever discovered um, mm -hmm. because it wasn't it was denied to me. But now that it's out, there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. It's, it's out there and um, that the marketplace is on and uh, and and competition is is it's game on, you know. So that's why I find it so exciting. Yeah, no, there's a lot of great points there. I'm this geographic consensus you describe. Have you seen uh, Jason P. Lowry on Twitter yet? No, he's he's MIT. He's a he's a graduate student, so he's a young guy, but he's in the MIT. Uh, I hope I'm saying this right. It's he's in Space Force, U.S. Space Force, and he's attending MIT. But he has expanded the thesis of Bitcoin a bit, and he's saying that we've always had to project force across distance, which that's power. I believe that's the physics definition of power to establish consensus. And he he takes this really deep down. He says this is like Darwinian. It's biological that 
animals need to do this. Um, but that it, at the nation state level, we've, we've used basically war as the property consensus protocol. It's like, which aggregation of human willpower can bring the most force to bear, which today is the United States. And therefore we get to determine the distribution of property rights. So through that same lens, he's analogized Bitcoin as being kind of this bloodless property distribution protocol where it's you're still projecting force across space and time, right? Through the mining network, we're projecting energy, but it's done in a nonviolent way. So, um, you know, I can't help, and the way you describe the internet being this kind of like theater for pure capitalism, right? Where you just have the uninhibited competition of ideas competing and, and dying by their own merits, right? Versus this mode of statism we have specifically with a central bank that just is the opposite, right? This, there's not there's not merit anymore. It's being sucked out of the marketplace, actually. Um, as more currency is produced and we put more zombie companies on life support, we're interrupting this Darwinian impulse of the marketplace. And it seems intuitive almost that what the, the outcome of that, right? It's destructive to capital, destructive to wealth, destructive to human cooperation. So I take it uh, you're probably bullish on the digital age overall. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, on your point about communities, uh, geographic communities projecting force, um, I absolutely think that's Dar Darwinian. I think it's 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 innate to the human condition. In other words, um, the societies we have now are the outcome of a lot of circumstance, you know, historical circumstance, um, but our ability to self-organize in individual groups um, and through that competition, meaning that there are dominant groups and I'm not passing any judgment on any kind of political system or economic system. Frankly, it's just this group of humans in this area decided to organize themselves in this way. Um, and it, at this particular moment, moment in time, they happen to be more successful than this other group. And so they, mm -hmm. they are able to project your will, like you said. Um, and I think that the primary way I agree with you that that's been expressed is through violence. Uh, and I think that culminated with kind of the nuclear age, right? That we have mm -hmm. nuclear weapons and we've gotten to the point where it's an existential expression at this point. If mm -hmm. you were to extrapolate that to, you know, China and the U S uh, projecting their respective societies upon one another, it could mean annihilation of the species. Right. Okay. So we've gotten to a, a physical limitation on that, on that being the way in which successful societies can continue to, to, test each other, if you will, mm -hmm. in their effectiveness, because then it means the end of humanity. And I think that's obvious now to political establishment. So it's now a point where the only way they can do that is through fin financialization, that you express uh, your dominance to other other groups of organiza or organizations of humans through, through money, through financing, mm -hmm. through purchasing power, through the mm -hmm. dollar. I think the dollar has been the most weaponized um, instrument maybe in human history um, more yes. than the bullet. So, um, yeah, I think uh, now that we have these alternatives and they're super national uh, and they exist in abstraction space, the bullet is irrelevant. And now the dollar, um, I still think the dollar is actually going to continue to get stronger as it eats its way through other fiat currencies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the military of the United States is so powerful yet still, and we have nuclear weapons and all that, that um, that there's still some momentum, I guess, to that old way of expressing uh, power and will. But I do think that we're seeing that's this the beginning of the end. Um, and what we need to work on now is an alternative to that, because when that system eventually uh, disintegrates, we're all going to be so dependent on it as humans on this planet, that it could have equally catastrophic consequences as a nuclear war, right? Mm -hmm. We could devolve into mass um, property confiscation, you know, mm -hmm. at, at, at nation levels and individual levels, violence. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm a strong believer that we need to build systems on the internet that can take, take the role from the dollar um, and, and take that role in, in a mutually responsible way. 
where we don't continue to perpetuate the injustices of the past and impose on one another's will. And like you said, use the power of the marketplace and competition to determine um, what's going to happen. Yes. There's this old saying that um, every tool is a weapon if you hold it right. (laughs) So this is kind of the way I think about fiat currency. It's like, okay, gold was money as a result of free market selection. For a number of reasons, you know, we've talked about a lot on the show, but it didn't scale, right? Because gold's not very portable. So you need to abstract it in currency to make it globally transactable for a globalizing society. Uh, so that's a great tool, but it when you break the peg to gold, then you just give all of that, uh, you give this unlimited capacity to the currency issuer to basically confiscate the property of everyone else. Right. And that's all it's good for, by the way. There's not, it's kind of like that tool of currency that was useful to scale gold is being held in a way that enables us to weaponize the dollar. And that is exactly, I agree with you that the dollar is perhaps the greatest weapon of all time. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a way to quantify this per se, but if you look maybe in terms of how much wealth or or willpower has been siphoned away through currency issuance, right? It's the number one export in the U.S. We think, I don't know what we think we export these days, finance, whatever else, but it's inflation, right? We're, we're exporting inflation mostly. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think we're, um, I think we export servitude. Uh, we export mm-hmm. the dollar uh, having its properties as being very fungible globally um, and ha- and using the merits of the government, which, look, as a U.S. citizen, I take um, responsibility for that in mm-hmm. that I've been a beneficiary of that. Uh, yeah. And there's a guilt associated with that yeah. um, because I know that my currency is being used um in some part through my benefit, and I benefit from a very high standard of living because of that. Mm-hmm. But I know that it's causing a significant damage to uh, everyone globally. Mm-hmm. And eventually, it's going to lead to real problems at home. You know, we've talked about Triffin Dilemma, and I know you know about the Triffin Dilemma. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that because of the irresponsibility of the management of that currency, it's going to end up being a net negative, not a net positive, even though in the short term, I'm, I'm a beneficiary of it. So mm-hmm. I, I can just kind of take those two things apart. I can see them separately. Um, but, you know, the, the thing with the dollar as a, as a weapon is that they ex, we export uh, servitude, that we export debt. Uh, and that debt um, through our force means that it's compelled to be paid back. So what the dollar does is it instantiates debt into creation of others, mm-hmm. which means that eventually their will is bent to mine as, or mine being the US, right? Mm-hmm. Meaning I issue this debt into the world um, and I'm buying time, future time with that debt because you have to pay it back. And not only that, you have to pay it back with interest. Mm-hmm. Oh, and you know, if you have, if, if you can't source those additional dollars, well, that's just too bad. You, you know, you need to kind of pay up. Uh, in time, and that if it happens to cripple your economy, and I can buy more bananas or more livestock for cheaper, well, that's kind of your problem. So that that's I, I have a deep moral problem with that approach, mm-hmm. um, and that's why I'm so compelled by uh, decentralized networks because it's an alternative to that. I I can't compel anyone to buy them or use them. Uh, but they have properties that if they do decide to buy or use them, we can we can transact fairly. We can mm-hmm. compete on our merits. And um, you just as much as I can't compel them, they can't compel me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I feel it's a more moral framework to start from, right? Uh, for And it precludes the abuse and exporting of, of servitude and, and debt. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, there's the... Um... I think it was John Adams said there's two ways to conquer and enslave a country. One is by the sword, one is by debt. So this, you know, we're calling the US dollar a weapon. It's not even an analogy, really. It's like actually a weapon. Uh, it's um, 
And, and we we know that um, you know through like the SWIFT system uh, and through sanctions, we know that uh, the U.S. government and the international community, to a large extent, um, has weaponized the dollar to impose its will on governments or jurisdictions that doesn't like. Sometimes I agree with that. Sometimes I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, the point, though, is that um, they certainly never agree to it, whatever that mm-hmm. wherever those people live. Uh, and if we are not actively at war with them, I feel that's an unjust kind of uh, uh, negotiation um, that mm-hmm. by currency, uh, I'm forcing some state that I don't I don't live there. I have no problem with their people, but we're forcing that state to kind of bend to our will. And that can only lead to a bad place. I mm-hmm. think ultimately um, that ends up coming back on you. And, and it's no surprise that those same jurisdictions and emerging markets economies are the ones most desperately looking for alternatives because they feel this oppression firsthand. Mm-hmm. So I worry as a US citizen that if we don't find an alternative and develop a more equitable structure, eventually, um, all these emerging markets and all the all the people that are being abused by this system are going to turn right around and and uh, find an alternative, and then it, then it's a collapse, and and that I, yes. I don't want. Yeah, the, we run the risk, and this is true generally of statism, in my estimation, is that you know the state revenue model is taxation and inflation. Basically, these are both coercive means of revenue, so it's it's extraction, it's theft. Um, there's no really other way to look at it. I mean, it, it sounds like a bitter pill to swallow. People are like, what do you mean tax is theft? I don't, I thought tax is like, you know, government's got to make money somehow. The problem is again, back to that sole human right of choice, right? Is it a consensually negotiated transaction? Is it a, is it a free market transaction or not? And in the case of taxation and inflation, it's simply not, right? You just get a bill, right? Or they just print money. There's no approval process. Um, There's no negotiation, frankly. So I really like this. This is starting to just kind of crystallize in my mind here is that we could, maybe one way to define a weapon actually is that it, it is something that allows you to impose your willpower on another. Um, and again, could be the dollar, right? Where you're just sort of printing dollars. So you're confiscating purchasing power. It could be a gun, right? When when you go to war, the reason the two sides are shooting each other is so they can eventually get the other side to bend to their will, right? Sign the armistice, pay tribute, give up the territory, whatever it is. So that's really interesting. That's a good, that's a useful framing, I think, that connects something that's clearly a weapon like a gun to something that people don't understand as a weapon, which is the dollar. Um, I want to ask you this. So, so it's perfect on its simplicity. It's just perfect how, how effective it is as a weapon because it's nonviolent, but it perpetuates uh, an incredible amount of will throughout the disproportionate will throughout the world. Can I, can I just mention one thing you said Please. about taxes? Um, Ideally, in a, in a well-functioning society, the taxes you would want to be taxed if um, that taxation represented you and, um, and, and, and devices that maybe the market didn't supply. Um, but I think the problem is that the people who decide taxes, again, very few in number, um, can never properly align with the people they're representing. And so ultimately, are subverted by by that power. So um, you get the obviously expected consequence that they pass policies which no longer represent you as a citizen, right? They start mm-hmm. spending uh, irresponsibly or they don't help you or your family or your community's life in any meaningful way. Um, and it starts to fulfill their own agenda. And I think that's why confidence in government is kind of at an all time low because um, just like the central bank has irresponsibly managed the dollar, I believe governments have also irresponsibly managed our votes and our willpower. They're, they're supposed to be there to express and amplify our willpower. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead, they've taken that opportunity to amplify their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's fairly obvious. So people are apathetic, I think. Um, and so th- those are two intermingled problems, I believe. 
Yeah, this is this is an important distinction, actually. So when um, so the term taxation, I used to think, and I still do think, by the way, that as a type of state or governance model or protection producing enterprise is likely necessary because we need property rights in the physical world. Like Bitcoin's great that it's a property right independent of the state and it's the most important property right, it's money. But everything else, like your home, your car, your house, you need some protection producing agency. I still think that will be a valid, uh, not just valid, that will be a real useful industry, even if Bitcoin succeeds. But the difference, I think, is that they will charge a market rate for those services. So they will have to actually compete for customers, just like every other business in the world because they can't steal, right? It's going to be so much harder. Inflation would be closed as a revenue opportunity if, on a Bitcoin denominated world. And taxation would be much more symmetrical and that they, it, it would be harder to impose it because if you try to impose it on somebody and you don't give them adequate services for the fees you're charging them in taxation, then they have hypermobile capital in Bitcoin. They'll leave your country and go somewhere else that will serve them better. So I agree with you on that. I, I guess the term, and this is, I've read Rothbard recently. So now when I say the term taxation, I'm, I think I'm using more of the Rothbardian definition where he's saying that is taxation means it's non-consensual state extraction. But I agree there'll be some form of consensual taxation I don't know what you call that. It's just service fee revenue at that point. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're put into a common pool because there's an economy to scale to do so, to, mm -hmm. to get some kind of rev, uh, service that we all can derive value from. It's just more of an efficiency that we, yeah. through, through not being compelled, we choose to put into that common pool because we want to see that benefit rather than just going out alone. Like I could have my own police force. I could have my own army, but that would be very expensive to me. Uh, if I pool that with others and we decide we want a police force or an army or whatever it is to protect physic, physical things, yeah. um, it just could be more efficient. The problem is that that's lost in our political process because there it's no longer aligned um, with being efficient yeah. because they're a monopoly on it. Um, they don't have any competitive pressure. So there's right. really no reason to be efficient. Uh, if they did have competitive pressure, then I could get those same services theoretically for a lot less and maybe right. higher quality. Uh, and they couldn't be used against me also. Um, so again, another reason I'm so bullish, these, uh, these, these decentralized systems, because they offer that as a future promise. Yes, agreed. Um, so I want to circle back to something we talked about earlier, this exorbitant privilege of being the global reserve currency. Um, many people have agreed with me. I think it's pretty hard actually to argue against that, that it is, you know, it's, it's become almost a trope at this point to talk about the exorbitant privilege. Like we understand it's asymmetrically in favor of the United States. Um, but even those that agree with me on that point will disagree that it was done intentionally. They think the system was not, whether it's central banking or Bretton Woods conference, like, like, no, we were just trying to scale global commerce and it just happened to end up like this. Where do you fall in that camp? Like, do you, where do you, how do you see intentionality? Um, how do you see intentionality, the role of intentionality in the current structure of global central banking um, with the Fed at the center? I don't even think it needs to be that conspiratorial, like that, you know, they sat in a room together and rule this, uh, hash this all out for their mm -hmm. own benefit, which could have happened. I'm not saying that didn't. Um, what, I was, what I believe is that all behavior follows incentives. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, eventually the incentive was for biased in favor of the US. So, mm -hmm. You know, year after year, day after day, in the implementation of how you execute on that, which is time based, it's not just a static event like this happened and then everything follows. Mm -hmm. It's a everyday continuous migration in its particular direction. Mm -hmm. I think that if the incentives are misaligned, then the behaviors will follow, and eventually you get to the the, the wrong outcomes. So, mm -hmm. 
Um, you don't even need vast amounts of conspiracy. You can have little spouts of conspiracy here and there, but eventually just those incentives just naturally get to the outcome we have now. And that, that's a more difficult thing to fix uh, because you really have to get to the root of those incentives and fix and, and, and address them. And, and mm -hmm. our, our financial system globally is so dependent on the dollar and the way that those incentives have been set up that the, it is going to be, it's going to take a massive effort to unwind that and, and realign it. So it's mm -hmm. beneficial to, to people. Uh, so do I think a bunch of people conspire to self-serve? Of course, but theoretically, right after they died, you know, maybe another set of group could have come mm -hmm. along and fixed that, but they chose not to. Why didn't they choose to? It's because they continue to have some incentive that's driving that behavior and 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 there's no reason to rectify it. Yes. It's like if uh, you, know, you, you can, if you continue to benefit from it, why change it? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and again, incentives being kind of the prime mover of human action, they also blind you to things, right? If you're profiting from some activity, you're going to be willfully blind to any externalities or negative aspects to that activity. And I agree with you that I, you know, when people talk about this topic of intentionality, it seems like they're thinking black or white, like either it was a conspiracy on Jekyll Island and it all flowed from there, or it just kind of accidentally happened. But I, I actually agree with you completely that there's this element of gradualism to it. It's just like what decision makers are coming into what position, what are their incentives? And then what is the direction or trajectory that takes the system? And it appears to me pretty obvious when you consider that government via the central bank is monopolizing money that becomes a pool of unlimited revenue for them right it's just whatever that's, that's, problem bad decision you make just print more money and keep going it's it's the nature of corruption it's much more insidious and and time lag than than people appreciate mm. um i don't think a central banker i don't think anyone's born saying you know when i grow up i want to become a central banker and right. and be a uh, an insider uh yeah. fe feeding off the spigot it, it happens through a long gradual process and um you can get lost in that process and you can even go through the mental gymnastics of justifying, even on an ongoing basis, those externalities. So even if you're fully aware that those externalities are happening to other people, you can find ways of morally justifying it to yourself and to others. And as long as you have enough others uh, who support you, you're going to continue to justify it and yes. you won't change your behaviors. So you'll just overlook it. And that, that's the nature of corruption. That, that's, a, that's part of the human condition. That's right. And I think that's, you know, I, I say it a lot on Twitter, but I, I kind of welcome our robotic overlords, uh, <laughs> meaning I, I look forward to a time where we can kind of offload some of these things to um, algorithms rather than, than humans, not everything. Mm -hmm. I think we need agency, but uh, some of these more important things that are not shouldn't be corruptible, mm -hmm. uh, we have to start figuring out how uh, ways of, of, you know, Delegating that to them. Right? And, and that's one of the things I saw with uh, decentralized uh, networks like Bitcoin is that, mm -hmm. wow, look, we have a set of consensus rules that we can start um, delegating this responsibility of, of, of purchasing power and value to rather than individuals that are corruptible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, um, you know, a couple of things. One, when, when you voluntarily adopt rules versus having them shoved down your throat. Like it creates peace, right? Like everyone's there. There's no externality, right? If we're all coming to the table to play the same game, we all know the rules, the rules don't change. Then we're all going to play by the rules, right? There's no, there's no opportunity to bend the rules to my favor. Like that's the ideal situation. If I can sit down at a poker table and I can somehow get the ability to change hand rankings right? Every hand, then I can just twist the rules basically and always win. And that's effectively what a central bank is doing. They're just twisting the rules of money such that they, their shareholders always win. And it's- uh, Maybe I should have become a central banker when I was a kid. I, <laughs> I became an engineer. What a mistake. <laughs> I don't think it's worth it though. You know, like even if you're in that position, you look at these people and they're just, I mean, look at the head of uh, the BIS, Bank of International Settlements guy. It's like, okay, he's 
rich, he's very wealthy and he's in a position of probably profiting in perpetuity, but doesn't look like somebody I'd want to be, you know? I agree. Um, I agree. And I like this point that you make on this post hoc rationalization because we do that too, right? Human beings do that. So you can rationalize anything. You can go and do anything and rationalize it to yourself. You can tell yourself a story to justify it. Um, and that is how we self-deceive. That is how we engage in self-deception. So I've, this is one thing I've been arguing is that fiat currency is like self-deception at scale, right? Like we've gradually created these little rationalizations like, oh, we need to print just a little more money to give the government a little more stimulus to get the economy doing. And it's just this complex layering of lies. And now we have, you know, the culmination of that is Jerome Powell in 2021 on television saying monetary policy and wealth disparity are completely unrelated, right? The printing of money has nothing to do with dispossessing uh, people economically. And it's like, do you believe that? Does does he actually believe that? Because it's not, it's, I mean, it doesn't take that long. It, I mean, I guess it does. There's a lot, I'm, I might be a little biased here because we've been studying this for years and, you know, not everyone thinks like you and I, but how can you rationalize in your mind that the printing of money is not dispossessing people? It's like, you know, you're violating the value of that dollar. You know, you're giving those dollars out to large players first and people living on fixed income or living paycheck to paycheck are getting it last. How in the hell do you rationalize that that's not creating wealth disparity? That is, I, I, I think the people you surround yourself with, in other words, there's an infrastructure that supports those decision makers. And that infrastructure is continuously reinforcing the lie, telling them that what they're doing is necessary, just. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, right. And so, you know, you can lie to yourself all day long, but when you have other people telling you the same lie, then you really believe it because you must be on the right track. And not only is it just any Joe Schmo six pack off the street, it's you know, it's the politicians telling you, it's the head of banks telling you, it's the head of corporates telling you, it's the most important people in the society telling you that, of course, you're going to believe your own lie because you have all these people reinforcing that day after day. Um, you know, so, so, so that's, that's, that's the ultimate promise to me is that these systems um, make it so that you could tell your lie all day long. If you all want to get together in a room, a hundred of you, a thousand of you, and tell these lies to each other, fine. Mm -hmm. You can you can believe what you want, but what people will choose is their their own lie or their own consensus. What what they agree to is having value, um, and there's nothing you'll be able to do that. And I think this is going to get to a point where they're going to try to enforce their lie on everyone else, mm -hmm. and that's the battle that's going to happen, I think, and it's starting to happen, is that um, they'll get to a point where they want to compel everyone to believe what they believe. And I, I view value expression as important as freedom of expression. I think it's just yes. as fundamental to be able to write something or, or have free speech as it is to express value in the way I so choose. Yes. If I want to encapsulate my purchasing power in uh, something other than the dollar, um, why why do I have to be compelled to do that? Right now, I think it's compelled through loans, right? I have a loan on my, my house or my car. Uh, it's compelled through taxes. I have to get dollars to pay my taxes. Mm -hmm. um, that that's I, I think that over time, uh, especially as the switching costs between these networks continue to go down, mm -hmm. it'll be more and more difficult to compel the lie because mm -hmm. people won't be able to opt out. And the switching costs to go from one network to the other will go to zero. Right. So I can maintain all my wealth in Bitcoin if I want. Um, and when it comes time to pay my taxes, the switching costs will be near zero to go to dollars. But, um, you know, like you said, maybe we'll by then we'll have a competitive framework for those same services and I won't be compelled to pick that particular tax. Right. So yeah. I, I think that the end game is maybe not near, but it's in sight. Uh, which never before in human history, I think, would we even be in a position where we could say that, that the end game for this kind of compelled um, government and economic behavior is, would, would be in sight. And I, and I can see it. And I know you see it. Uh, I think a lot of your viewers see that. And that's what's so exciting.
It's scary. I have to say it's kind of scary. It is. It is because there's no historic precedent, right? We're really leaving. One way to think about this maybe is it, you know, (laughs) Peterson said this well one time, there's stability in tyranny or stability in the hierarchy, right? So there are a lot of benefits actually in terms of stability that we've had through this model of the nation state and taxation. Now it goes too far clearly and it starts to um, self-destruct, right? That's what hyperinflation is, right? It's a, there was a functional currency regime for X number of decades, but they took it too far. And then the whole thing implodes in hyperinflation. A lapse of consensus. Yeah. But so the scary part is, okay, we're exiting that type of stability permanently. So what does, what does, um, um, anarcho capitalism really look like, you know, like there's a lot of libertarian philosophy out there about it, but we don't have any real world examples of it. So that, you know, I guess it's kind of like a fear of the unknown. We just don't know exactly what this, this new world looks like. Um, I, I, think, you know, I think I think humans on their Maslow's hierarchy, they 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 really value security a lot, mm-hmm, oftentimes yes. more than freedom. Right. right. And Benjamin Franklin said it well. Right. The, 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 that that need for being secure and safe. Um, I, I'm this is not a judgment on the Chinese system, but mm-hmm. the Chinese population like for a large part the way that the CCP runs their government because yeah. it provides security and uh, an economic promise, et cetera. They value that a lot more than maybe Americans might value freedom of speech or other mm-hmm. things that are, are more Western. Um, so I'm not making judgment on that. I'm simply saying that security definitely commands a massive premium, which is why I think it's interesting that we see, you know, a lot of billionaires going into space because mm-hmm. into space, it's their first opportunity to experiment with anarcho-capitalism, right? You mm-hmm. could build a colony, you could build a space station, whatever. Uh, and those rules are completely um, distinct from the government, from the earth, for example. Mm-hmm. And that's very compelling because then you can experiment with all these different alternatives and see, are they going to work or not? And there's no guarantee they'll work, but at least you can experiment, you can try them. Whereas before, we never even had that, that choice. Yes. This is the first time. Yes. Yeah. You're back to the, the element of violence and coercion in the world, preventing experimentation. So it's anti-capitalistic. Um, I love this. So this idea of, of central bankers, bureaucrats, self-deceiving, what's coming to mind here is that because as we opened up, right, money is a lie. Effectively, it's a useful fiction. It's a useful lie. It's an, an imaginary construction. Um, And maybe some of this is we're getting a little bit muddied in the definitions of truth and lie. But what we mean is money is an imagined order, right? Just like the nation state, just like civil rights, anything else. But it seems to me that, and and as we said as well, incentives are the prime mover of human action. So people will come to support the lies that pay or the useful fictions that pay. And through that framing... Bitcoin is like the most truthful fiction we've ever had. <laughs> you know, if money's a use, useful fiction, but money is supposed to be just kind of an emblem for time and energy, and Bitcoin maps directly onto that. And the the fascinating thing about this is that as more people understand that there's more fairness in this game, they're going to naturally migrate towards it. You're changing the behavior in the old system. Because those lies, like the lie of fiat currency and statism, doesn't pay as much anymore, right? Inflation and taxation is declining. So is that what's the the big, I mean, is that the big transformation here in the digital age? Is that there's just more, I don't know if it's transparency or sunlight or uh, maybe... I've called the liquidity of ideas where people are just exchanging information more seamlessly. So we're, we're zeroing in on more truthful fictions under which to orient ourselves. Yeah, I think they're, well, they're more, they're, they'll, the market will naturally converge on those fictions that are um, most beneficial to the individual, meaning that the alignment of the 
of, of the incentives of the whatever the whatever that uh, currency is, um, if the incentives are aligned in such a way that its constituents are benefit the most, will naturally attract more inflows. So if you compare the fiat network with the Bitcoin network, if the Bitcoin network has rules of consensus that are superior to the fiat network, then you'll get flows into the Bitcoin network. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that, that the, mm -hmm. the price is a manifestation of those flows mm -hmm. uh, from individuals leaving the fiat network into the Bitcoin network. And so the Bitcoin network, um, as it compounds on itself, as, as the people who leave the fiat network go into the Bitcoin network, they become the natural promoters of that because they're going to say, hey, guys, we've crossed the fence here. It's way better over here. The grass really is greener. Why don't you come along? It's in mm -hmm. your benefit and best interest to do so. The network effects compound and, and it continues to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, the people in the old network start to question their own lies and say, well, maybe our consensus system is not so great. <laughs> maybe we need to change something here because, uh, well, first, you know, they'll try to uh, stop the Bitcoin network. And, and you know that yeah. they'll do as much as they can to, to uh, preclude those flows from yeah. accelerating. And yes. I think they're accelerating. And we yes. can see that through the exponential appreciation. But the first thing they'll try to do is just stop the flows. And then they'll try to slowly re reduce the rate of flow. Yeah. Um, and then eventually, like you said, they'll realize, okay, we need to do something here to reverse the flow. What can we do to compel people to go in the other direction? Right. Um, and and that, that's why I think uh, things like Bitcoin are unstoppable. Because you can go through any manner of violence or, or whatnot, but... Just try and stop it, but at the end of the day, it's an abstraction. You mm -hmm. cannot, you cannot put a genie back in the bottle. It's an idea that mm -hmm. can't be stopped. You can slow it down. You can make it shrink for a while, but you mm -hmm. will never make it disappear as long as there's an internet, and even to some extent, as long as humans can continue to communicate and now have that as a concept, mm -hmm. you can never make it go away. So I don't think uh, I, I think in, Bitcoin is an unstoppable meme. I think that um, decentralized ledger technology is an unstoppable meme by its very design nature. And ne networks, of traditional consensus networks like a government or a geography, um, there's nothing that can be done because they're super national. You would, ha you would have to shut down the whole world, mm -hmm. you have to shut down the internet, shut down the power grids, literally shut down the very things that your own consensus networks relies on for mm -hmm. commerce and, yep. and taxation. It's a, it's, I don't want to call it an infection, but it is very much like a virus, right? Mm -hmm. It lives in the host body. Mm -hmm. um, th these, these supranational currencies live in the host body. Mm -hmm. they, they, you can't get rid of them without killing the body. <laughs> that, yeah. That makes any sense. No, it's, it's an excellent point. And for the state to really stop it, to your point, it's like, you'd have to shut down internet, power grid, all these systems basically forever. Cause it's not, a, it's not even enough to just turn them off. Like they have to be turned off forever. And then at that point they're the state would be cutting off its nose to spite its face because that would destroy its tax base. That would destroy the global division of labor. There'd be no wealth to tax, right? It would just be net destructive for everyone. Um, so it seems like if we follow self-interest that the path of least resistance and the optimal strategy, if you own a monopoly on money is to just produce currency and buy the thing that no one can stop. Um, and I love that you said that the, there's that quote from Victor Hugo that nothing is more unstoppable than an idea whose time has come. And that I've analogized Bitcoin to the number zero actually, because this was, it was like an idea, you know, it was just it emerged uh, governments resisted it. The church resisted it, but ultimately zero is just way more useful. Like a zero based numeral system was way more useful than Roman numerals and, you know, other forms. So today, what do we, we all use zero based numeral system. Um, and I, I, I like your point too, where you're this visualization of competing consensus networks and more people are going to identify the stability of rules in the Bitcoin network, which is equivalent to fairness, right? I can, I know I can go here with fixed rules that I, 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 as an inhabitant of the Bitcoin network am no longer exposed to asymmetric projections of willpower of others. No one's opinion can affect me. And 
So as more people move into the Bitcoin network, the other result I see here is that the laggards in the fiat network are going to be taxed harder and harder, right? The state's revenue base in terms of number of people is just contracting, but the costs don't contract for the state, right? They keep growing. They just keep spending, spending, growing, growing. So they're going to tax the individuals that remain harder and harder, which does what? That increases the pressure of outflows from fiat consensus network to Bitcoin consensus network because they're being taxed harder and harder through inflation. So yeah, it's, like, it's, like squeeze, it's like squeezing a bar of soap. You yes. Know, hard, how do you squeeze it? The faster it slips out. I, I 100% agree with that. Yeah, yes. I think that's what's that's going to happen. And it'll be a game of whack-a-mole for a while. I, what I don't know is the rate at the, the rate at which these flows will occur. And I think that's what everybody wonders. Um, you know, if I had a pool and there was a big hole in my pool, um, as long as I can fill that pool at the same rate that that water mm-hmm. flows out, it will appear like the pool isn't damaged or draining. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as long as, but once I can't fill that water as fast as what's pouring out, it will be become very apparent that that pool is draining. Yeah, and I think that's where the end game's coming for fiat. Um, and I'm not so sure it'll happen like next year or anything like that. But what you can see, first of all, that the pool has a big hole in it, and that there's a ton of water flowing out of it. And some of that water is being collected by other pools like mm-hmm. like Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, if all they do by adding more water to it is fill all these other pools, and eventually uh, there'll be no more water left in the pool, especially yeah. if they you know send people in to try and and uh, squeeze more out of it. So um, I, I definitely think that the the first reaction is going to be to try and stop it try to slow it down um what i'm curious is if they'll ever try and tax bitcoin and and i don't see how they would necessarily do that i know that virtual asset service providers are now being compelled to uh divulge as much information about their their customers um Mm -hmm. and fatf uh, and the kyc and aml compliance all those regulatory standards are really very heavy the travel rules very heavy in an attempt to get their arms around this explosion. Um, and I think it's the first approach of how do we stop these outflows? Because once mm-hmm. it starts bleeding, it's going to bleed rapidly. Mm-hmm. Um, and the more the Fed prints, the worse the, the, the patient is going to bleed. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, these rules are now attempts to track it, see who's getting it, um, eventually with the end game of, of, of somehow taxing it and reversing the flow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's well said. I wonder if um, it may just get to the point where they're not even concerned with reversing the flow anymore and they're just trying to track the flow and tax it, you know, almost like, and I've there's been some theory about this that Bitcoin could, we could have black market Bitcoin and white market Bitcoin, right? Like white market that's been KYC AML washed. It's on a federal regulated exchange. You know, they're fully tracking it and tracing it versus black market Bitcoin, which would be transcendent of global uh, jurisdictions. You know, you could move it in and out of jurisdictions. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Hey, everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yen Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So, whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white-label your own Bitcoin product or service, Consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. I love this uh, view of willpower. Like we're talking about how do humans manifest their willpower into physical power? All right, that's kind of the, 
the point of all this economic stuff we're doing. But we also, the flip side of that is we have to be protected from the willpower of one another. These are the systems we've been building, right? This is English common law. This is habeas corpus, all of these things. Fair rules, right? Fair play, essentially. The, the thing I'm thinking about, though, is so we have the state itself is this force amplifier of willpower, right? Whoever is in that position can project their will on others. That's what a politician, what's well, what political consensus in the modern sense is doing. Um, and historically, gold was kind of a regulator on that, right? If a government was being tyrannical or irresponsible with, with a money printer, people would take their gold and leave the country, right? And the gold could be used elsewhere because it was a free market money. That option has been largely closed for people because gold's been, the market's been cornered to some extent. It's, it's harder to move gold and secure gold, conceal gold, all these things. So Bitcoin, I guess, at least promises to maybe fill, fill that void is that it can be a regulator on statism that if, if a state gets, uh, tyrannical or abusive people have, have an exit option effectively. What I want to ask you about is how do we know, like when, at what point is a state overstepping its bounds? And the thought I had here was kind of the rate at which property is being violated. So this could be inflation, could be taxation, could be the, the specter of, um, you know, jab mandates, right? That's property violation as well. So how do you think about that? How do you think about statism and where it falls on the spectrum between like a good useful fiction and an abusive uh, useful fiction or an abusive fiction? Uh, that's a great question. I, 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 I go, I look at every, being an engineer, I come from a tradition of looking at things in rates, mm. how fast things change with respect to other things. Uh, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, you've got this goal that you value and your purchasing powers might, might be one way to get, achieve that. Um, I look at governments and I look at these consensus systems as trains and they're all going to some fictional city far into the future and the trains are moving at different rates. Um, and you know you might hop from one train to the other, depending on which one you think is gonna bring you there fastest. I think that governments that, um, in terms of statism, uh, all they really do is put the brakes on that train. Um, so they provide an incentive for you to just hop onto the other train. So the more they accelerate that process, which is really decelerization in this sense, the more they preclude you from reaching that, that uh, golden city in the distance, um, the, the faster you're going to realize that it's better to go to another train because it, it'll get you there faster. So mm -hmm. if, if it starts off with an a slow imposition of your property rights, which is what I think has been very clever by the Fed, is that mm -hmm. it has been able to do it in a very slow and innocuous way. Uh, and I think it's been able to do it in the context of other really big time changing factors like globalization. So mm -hmm. for example, if you look at, you know, post 1971, the monetary policy obviously has been reckless and uh, unpredictable and, and, and in favor of a few, but it's also been under the context of, you know, mass globalization, mm -hmm. uh, technological expansion. And so it's been very easy to hide behind these other factors to not be the sole, uh, to not get all the blame. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it's perfect in that scenario to uh, do the slow boil and not be the one that, oh, it's not that our train is slower. It's that all these other things are going on um, and there's nothing we can do about that. So you just have to continue to accept your, your, the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so my, my, my roundabout answer to your question is that I think um, the rate of, of, of application of oppression is important. If you do it slowly and innocuously over time, you can get people to accept more and more of it until it becomes either it hits a breaking point or until it becomes so obvious 
that there's no way to hide it anymore. And, and that's where I think we are now, is that the reason that it's been so successful and the reason it's occurred over such a long period of time relative to, to like my lifespan, which effectively my whole life, um, is that this is just what I thought was normal. I, we've normalized abuse. Mm -hmm. We've normalized uh, uh, this uh, deviation. Uh, and, and so it's the expectation. You think this is healthy and normal when it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that realization that I didn't come to until late into adulthood. Um, and it's the most frustrating part about that. That's the part that I told you earlier. I feel like I was denied that uh, until my adulthood. And uh, that's that's unfortunate because had I realized that uh, early on, I never would have made some of the decisions I made. So it's mm -hmm. feel a little bit of life denied there. But at least my children will have the benefit of that insight that, that, that this is something I tell them regularly, and I'm sure you do with your family, that you have this choice and um, this is what's really going on. And you need to be aware of it uh, and act accordingly to mm -hmm. your best interest. So, uh, so, so to me, it's about the rate at which uh, these policies are applied. And I think that they're accelerating. Mm -hmm. And we can see that acceleration in monetary policy, you know, in QE and 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 uh, uh, in fiscal policy in terms of stimulus um, and in terms of uh, government policy. And I think the pandemic kind of accelerated a lot of that. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were already occurring. That acceleration was already occurring. But now it's like supercharged it mm -hmm. because uh, there was no alternative. Um, so, you know, there might be a great awakening where a large percent of the population uh, awakens to the kind of realizations you and I are having, and that could lead to a, a political manifestation. Like we could, we we see politicians now being elected that are pro Bitcoin, for example, mm -hmm. or yeah. in cities, in senates, in in, in states. Um, so we could see a, a great awakening there, uh, and and that, that's encouraging because maybe um, that means that they won't take the violent approach. If if there's enough that do awaken in that manner. Um, then they won't try to change the outflows um, using coercive tactics. Maybe they will just skip that step, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, being optimistic here, but maybe they'll skip that step and, and embrace it uh, and, and, and understand that it could be, um, at least in the United States' perspective, an economic uh, advantage to embrace it and accept it. Similar to we've seen this migration with, with the miners to Texas and, and mm -hmm. other places, low energy. I think that's a form of, hey, you know, this is an opportunity here if we embrace it, uh, we, we could benefit in the long run. So I'm cautiously optimistic. Mm -hmm. I think the oppression will continue until morale improves, <laughs> but yeah. uh, but I'm cautiously optimistic that maybe enough people will awaken and that COVID could be this blessing in disguise that accelerates this process. Yeah, I, I, I too am optimistic seeing people like Senator Loomis. Um, I think Rand Paul recently said that you know, Bitcoin could could really succeed in a meaningful way. And in my mind, it's really getting back to the roots of America, frankly. It's like the reason America succeeded originally is because we had low and, you know, all the things we've been saying today, low and predictable taxes, you know, free trade, this ethos of laissez-faire free market capitalism. I mean, Bitcoin is basically the ultimate implementation of those principles, Right, it's just it's got rule of law. It is sound money. Uh, it's kind of an inviolable property right if it's done properly. Um, but I think this this is a really useful way to think about that progression is in rate of change terms, as you're saying. And this is how this is the engineering mindset, right? It's like we're dealing with complex systems. There's stocks and flows everywhere. It's you have to see. Where are the connection points? What are the rates of change between systems to project forward what's going to happen, right? And so you can think about this in a couple of ways. One is that's how we've maintained the fiat illusion historically. It's because all the currencies are being depreciated against one another. So long as no one did it too fast, then it, no one could tell the difference, right? It was like, you just have to- that, That's what I think the move off the gold standard was really about. Mm -hmm. Was uh, you know creating FX markets that allowed for that that process to unfold globally, mm -hmm. rather than um, slowly at individual flare-up points. You know, you could have an Argentina or Turkey. Um, if you just made everybody fiat, then we could all kind of slowly debase the currency worldwide. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, 
uh, our currency will happen to uh, take the market share while we do that too. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, to, to uh, like, again, I don't think it was a planned thing, but it was definitely a, um, a behavior that was incentivized and continues to be incentivized. You know, we see share of dollar denominated global transactions continue to rise as the yep. do- dollar becomes supreme, yep. as it eats all the other fiat. And we see uh, stable coins, even in the crypto space, uh, proliferate mm-hmm. uh, because, again, the demand there from all these countries, which the Fed can't meet because of the Triffin dilemma, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the stable coins are meeting this global demand that the Fed can't even control. Right. How long is that going to be sustainable? Uh, and when does that collapse? We've already seen systemic collapses in the crypto market because of it, or at least insinuations. Um, so <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that um, that dollarization is the end game that's going to lead to the next phase. All the other fiats will fall to the dollar, uh, and then the dollar will fall to uh, digital assets. That, that's my view. I agree with that completely. Um, and this speaks to the, you know, the way I view this is it. Well, there's a couple of ways to view it, I guess. On the free market, we selected for one money, right? Gold became dominant. Why? Well, because money, as we've said, it's a network, but it's a network that only serves one purpose. So it's actually, you know, we're just moving economic value across space and time. The larger the network, the more liquidity that network provides, the more it satisfies that end of moving value, giving you maximum optionality across the maximum number of trading partners. That to me is intuitive to why it coalesces to one network. So we see that pressure towards dollarization. Um, and I think that will continue. I agree that currencies will, I, over the next 15 years, we're going to see, especially starting with the weaker international currencies first, working its way up the uh, the spectrum, we'll see them collapse. And I think it will initially be mostly into the dollar. But I think as Bitcoin continues to monetize and succeed, you could see kind of a tipping away from dollarization toward Bitcoinization. And and thinking in those rate of change terms is another useful framing for why Bitcoin succeeds, right? You've got continued acceleration, even exponential acceleration of dollar production, and you have exponential decay of Bitcoin production. It's going the other, you know, quantitative expansion on the dollar, quantitative tightening on Bitcoin. And when you think in terms of like dynamic adaptive systems, it's like, of course, this one that is more predictable, perfectly predictable, in fact, and is inflating less and less and less is going to devour the monetary premium from the one that's increasingly unpredictable and increasingly uh, inflating. So and I, your earlier point, I want to highlight that was brilliant too. That it was genius that the Federal Reserve or whatever the nation state did this slowly, right? That they've boiled the frog slowly. Um, and I think this is why there's again that book, The Sovereign Individual. They make the case that this is why U.S. capitalism outcompeted Soviet communism. Because Soviet communism just went straight for the jugular, right? We're just going to command and control everything. So they didn't give market opportunity. They didn't give market actors really any property rights to accumulate any wealth at all, right? They just they just took over the whole economy. Whereas in the U.S., we just monopolized money, really, and then we let market actors have private property rights, create wealth, and so the the economic surplus exploded. Which gave, which now gives the Fed and the government a larger reservoir of wealth from which to confiscate. So it was like it's Pretty a smart. very dollars and cents economic formula here of why the U.S. outcompetes the Soviet Union. But I think by that same formula, you see why Bitcoin outcompetes statism in general. It's like because people or groups denominating themselves in Bitcoin are just going to get richer than those that are not. So that will attract the best and the brightest and um, just lead to this migration we're, we're discussing. I think um, in, like everything in nature, it's driven by gradients. 
So mm -hmm. if you want faster flows uh, in a river, you know, you start the flow at the top of a mountain and you watch it go down. Or uh, if you want to heat up a room that's cold, you, you know, put your fire as intense as you can get. And that heat gr uh, gradient is drives the flow. So it warms up the room. So I think the stronger the gradients, which is what, I, what you're pointing out with respect mm -hmm. to fiat consensus networks and Bitcoin as a consensus network, it has an incredibly steep gradient. And in fact, that, that gradient continues to steepen because one endpoint is rising in terms of inflation, in terms of money printing. Mm -hmm. And then the other endpoint is deep is deflationary. The, mm -hmm. the, the supply and that stock to flow is decreasing, right? So you're mm -hmm. making this steeper and steeper gradient, which drives the exponential. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, the human network effect where the, the people who do cross that chasm, that gradient, almost automatically become an army of promoters because they're saying yes. this this network is so has these properties which are so much better than your old network. Why yes. would you stay there? And it's a black hole. It's something that is so steep, nothing can escape because once it goes in, the switching costs to go back in, in, almost impossible. You, yes. you will never, like, um, if you see something with that steeper gradient, you, if you spend your Bitcoin, you know you've made an error because in a very short order, as that gradient continues to steepen, you'll see how much of a purchasing power and how much of your will, future will, you gave up for that. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it becomes an event horizon where you're not even just giving up your future will, but you're giving up the ability to project will from your family, your descendants. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, that realization hits you. It's like, okay, if I let go of this now for some, and, and you may have to, you're compelled to because of mm -hmm. these other things in the world. But if I let go of it now, uh, I'm not just precluding myself, but my family. That's that's a, a profound revelation. Um, mm. And the thing is that that's just one gradient, right? We have all these other gradients that exist, like differences in power prices around the world, which incentivize people to migrate, miners, for example. We've got differences in... Um, if you can imagine how steep that gradient is with the dollar, can you imagine how steep that gradient is with the lira or mm -hmm. the Brazilian right. real or whatever? It's painfully steep that it's mm -hmm. compelling to the point where even if in the past you might have said, okay, I'm going to jump off our, the Argentinian train and I'm going to go to the dollar train. Now there's a whole new, a whole new train here, which isn't not even politically misaligned. Mm -hmm. It is global. Mm -hmm. And so you, you don't even run the risk of political misalignment by going on that particular train. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think as the switching costs continue to lower between those um, those gradient points, uh, the flows will, will rise. And, and that's what I think the proliferation of exchanges has done is um, globally as more and more exchanges pop up that service um, digital assets in their respective geography, it's just another outlet for that gradient to express itself. And it's just another opportunity for outflows. Now, there could be a very savvy local government go government that says, whoa, we need to change our behavior to change the flows and we're gonna completely reinvent policy mm -hmm. locally. And, and we're seeing maybe some examples of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, otherwise, it's just, it's inevitable. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, back to that thing about expressing will over space and time, mm -hmm. I think, I think by the Federal Reserve slowly and gradually implementing its policies the way it has in the last 40 plus years, uh, it, it's expressed the ability to, um, well, it's circumvented your chronological power, mm. right? So maybe geographically you had more power. Maybe as an American, I could take my dollars and buy around the world globally mm -hmm. at any given point in time. But chronologically, I've dim it's diminished my power over yes. time where- as an individual, I could support my family with a high school uh, education in the 1950s and 60s. Now, dual income, both college educated, post, you know, whatever. Right. That's the bare minimum just to have a decent middle class life. Yeah. That's the problem is that it's expressing chronologically um, through this slow boil, the ability to, to uh, you know, raise a family, express your, 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 your values uh, as a human being. And I think that's where it's going to get to the breaking point. And we're seeing that already. And, and the only thing that's kind of facilitating the continuation of that process is credit, mm -hmm. is indebtedness. And indebtedness is going to get to a breaking point where it's no longer serviceable. And so that will right. be the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, both 
government and at the individual level. It just won't be serviceable anymore. Yeah, I would say, you know, arguably we're probably already there in aggregate, you know, 350% global debt to GDP. Uh, I don't know if that includes all the entitlement programs either. Um, But no, yeah, excellent points there. And then this idea of, you know, comparing gradients and choosing the one that's more favorable to oneself in a world where switching costs are very low, like the, the practicality pushes you into something like Bitcoin. But then, I mean, those that really start to study it, it gets even deeper when you get into the, the morality of it, right? You're like, okay, not only is this better pragmatically, I'm in a better position, I'm safer, but I now see how the game is being played and it, at least for me, and I think others too, like I, I'm thinking of like Alex Gladstein and Nick Carter, like they've come out and written very trenchant pieces against the state and its abuses. You get this deeper impetus to want to evangelize Bitcoin. It's like, it's not just about protecting yourself and protecting others. It's like, guys, we're destroying our own moral fiber as a civilization <laughs> by, by preying on one another's property. Well, I mean, that's what Jesus Christ did with the Romans, and 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 um, there was an existing system that, uh, as a rebel conceptually, came across and um, said there is a better system here that more is more morally compelling. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at first, they were prosecuted and thrown to the lions, literally, and um, it took hundreds of years for it to eventually subvert that system, but it did. Because the power of those ideas uh, persisted. It, it was a more powerful, I hate to use the word meme, but it was a more compelling narrative that people could um, form complex societies around of, around because it, it delivered more value to individuals and therefore you could build these constructions that were more sophisticated. Eventually, the Catholic Church uh, in itself fragmented, right? The Reformation and you had a, a, a an evolution of that meaning process. Um, and that led to even more uh, choice and more diversity. And it led to where we are today. Yeah. I think that same process is occurring in this space is that, um, like you said, there is a morally compelling reason why you would make that choice. And yeah. that that appeals to a lot of people. That is a very important value um, that will keep them in that ecosystem. So that's the thing is, you know, when you get into these consensus-based networks, you have to first uh, make a choice. Am I going to leave it or am I going to stay in it? And if I have a reason to stay in it, besides just the obvious gradient, um, you will because it aligns with your personal values. And mm-hmm. not only will you stay in and, 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 um, and, and live in it, you will promote it. Mm-hmm. You'll spread the word. And, and that's why I see, um, I, 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 you know, <laughs> around my house, uh, we don't talk blockchain because I'm such an evangelist. My <laughs> wife is kind of like sick of hearing about it. But uh, I think um, all, I, all the wives of Bitcoiners and blockchainers are definitely sick of hearing about it. <laughs> but that, you know, they see our, our, I love us for our passion for it uh, and mm-hmm. appreciate it um, because we want to spread the word and we want to um, want to show people what we've seen. Um, and I, I didn't want to make the parallel to religion, but I just feel that it's the same kind of uh, narrative process in in he, us as humans that that um, first drive us to leave the old way and then mm-hmm. to to stay in it and then to help others come along. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm increasingly convinced that all of these useful fictions or imagined orders they're religious in nature, actually. And I've had conversations with several people. Um, the, yeah, that's just where I'm at currently. I don't think the modern conception of religion is some kind of archaic institution that we're evolving past. I don't think that's accurate. I think humans are inherently religious. So even, even an atheist is like, you're religious about your beliefs, right? You have faith in these beliefs. So that's a whole nother rabbit hole, but I agree with you that there's a religious quality <laughs> to these useful fictions. Um, I do want to highlight a point you said earlier, I thought was um, just great that, you know, inflation, I think, so one way to think about inflation is that when I say this, 
term, I mean specifically the arbitrary expansion of the money supply. It's effectively just harvesting the productive surplus of the economy, right? So people are trading and innovating, producing wealth and capital. But then the call options on that capital, which is a definition of money, are just being created by one institution that preserves that privilege violently and deceptively. So they're literally just harvesting. It's just taxation, right? They're just taxing the productive economic organism. Um, But globalization and digitization radically increased the productivity of the market over the past 50 years. Right, kind of one led into the other, really. And so I think this is maybe a perverse consequence I've been thinking of is like for all the potential liberty afforded by the digital age and Bitcoin, I think maybe early on it actually benefited the central bank complex by giving it more runway, right? There was just more economic surplus to harvest so they could hide this this scheme. Uh, more easily versus had 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 economic growth been very low, people would have felt it a lot more. 100% agree, especially for U.S. citizens, uh, because you can harvest it, harvest it globally through the exportation of the dollar. Um, you could you could spread out the pain, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's a lot right. easier to spread out the pain of over eight billion people than it is four hundred million. Right, and especially if you can deliver those four hundred million, the the fruits of the purchasing power of 8 billion, uh, it's perfect. Uh, mm-hmm. And technology is just a compounder of that because it allows you to couple the global markets through supply mm-hmm. chains for just in time. Um, and there's been, you know, that, and that's one of my, that, that's my pinned, twi- uh, pinned tweet on Twitter mm-hmm. is what I see is a view of uh, how aggregation at, at the central bank uh, and aggregation of technology providers has led to this wealth inequality uh, and um, you know, increasing uh, uh, lack of power in the individual, robbing mm, of, yeah. of people's power. Uh, and that I, I firmly believe that just based on the data, not, not even just a kind of anecdotal observation or sentiment, it's mm-hmm. just what the data says. It just, yeah. it just simply, you look at um, standard of living, life expectancies, uh, 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 gradients, global gradients. Mm-hmm. You you look at all these factors, and you it, you just you can see it. It's not it's not debatable. Mm-hmm. The I think what people debate is at this point is <clears throat> the rate at which that's occurring. You mm-hmm. see a lot of people on Twitter talking about how, whether we have inflation, hyperinflation, deflation. What they're really just talking about is the rate at which this a pain this pain is being spread around. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I find that ironic because. Okay, it doesn't really matter who's right. Uh, at the end of the day, the pain is still being spread around, uh, and there's no remediation in sight. I don't see any policy being advocated by either central banks or or governments to ameliorate that. I don't mm-hmm. see how they're going to turn around uh, debt to GDP. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't see how. Um, I, I guess maybe they're expecting some massively deflationary uh, technology innovations to mm-hmm. somehow fix it. Mm-hmm. Or a debt jubilee, some kind of mm-hmm. negotiated agreement globally by all governments that um, we're just going to forgive a lot of this burden. <laughs> I mean, that that could happen. It happened in ancient Rome, mm-hmm. but I just don't think it's likely for the foreseeable future, certainly not in the time frame of what's important for me and my family. Uh, so for now, um, I, I, I have to, and I would advise your viewers to seek out these alternatives and do what's best for you and your family. Um, and that could percolate up to society level, right? If we all uh, in- individually choose uh, what's best in this scenario um, and identify these rates, um, then that could end up having like an awakening effect like we talked about earlier. Yes, yeah, agree that the, the level of indebtedness of the existing system is essentially too far gone barring some economic miracle, right? Like a, I don't know what it would be, cold fusion or something like free energy. Again, like we just said, some free market catalyzed explosion like globalization or digitization that that causes the economic surplus to boom from which uh, central banks could, could draw, could siphon and harvest wealth from. If that 
barring that, I don't know, cold, call it cold fusion. I don't know what else it could really be. Um, this thing is done, you know, it's, it's going to implode. It ha- there has to be a day of reckoning. Let's, let's say that. I want to, so you mentioned this conversation has been great so far. So we initially started saying we'd talk about your pinned Twitter thread and we haven't even talked about it yet. Uh, maybe you could just give us high level, broad strokes, what that is about. Um because I think I think it sort of captures your at least part of your current macro thesis. I well, it starts with the premise that um, central banks, uh, you know, and, and first of all, I don't view banks as a mon- monolithic thing. Mm-hmm. Banks are, you know, there's multiple tiers. Of course, you've got your central bank, and you've got tier one banks, tier two, tier three, down to an individual local bank like a credit union or a small bank. Um, what we've seen in the United States in particular is a consolidation of banking across the board for several reasons. You know, the GFC, um, the need for capital requirements, economies of scale. Uh, basically, there's been this massive consolidation or aggregation of banking, which is mm-hmm. who, who is the decider of uh, credit issuance? Who's the decider of uh, how you're going to give out loans for small businesses and homes, et cetera? That consolidation, it leads to the same kind of corruption as we talked about earlier, Mm -hmm. uh, that you have misaligned incentives, that fewer and fewer people are incentivized to provide a service for for the majority of the people uh, that they're supposed to be be servicing. The the, the consequence of that then is you don't have any more local risk assessment. Um, Everything uh, naturally funnels itself into large aggregated business. It could be aggregated farming. Uh, aggregated data centers like AWS, Mm -hmm. uh, aggregated social networks like Facebook or or YouTube, Um, it naturally biases towards non-competitive frameworks. Eventually, Mm -hmm. you get kind of uh, winner-take-all aggregators in each category class. And obviously, that's not good for competition, for Mm -hmm. choice for the consumer. Um, And it's not a way to uh, express monetary um, uh, fairness, right? So, Mm -hmm. One of the things we see um, is that individuals are completely apathetic. They're disconnected because they don't see any p- political re- uh, consul- uh, solution to that. Uh, the, the, the very same politicians who are supposed to represent them are not um, making this competition fair. Uh, they're, they're not doing anything to uh, address uh, global uh, arbitrate. Uh, um, uh, when you have some kind of global gradient, like a labor or mm-hmm. environmental standard, um, people people make entire businesses off of just uh, uh, taking advantage over that gradient, right? So if you can build a factory in uh, Southeast Asia and pollute into the air without pricing any externalities, yeah. well, then you can ship a plastic toy to the United States for 10 cents. Right. There is no pricing of that ex- of those externalities. Um, and part of that is because aggregators are consolidating more and more power and, more, and fewer and fewer verticals. And that is um, driven largely by the way banking, lending, all of these things um, are, are, are structured and continue to concentrate. And I think that, you know, like, you know, you've pointed out many times on your channel, the ones closest to the spigot are the ones who are going to get to drink. Um, and the ones with, quote unquote, the more credit worthiness or in the judgment, the risk assessment of the banks um, can service their debts. The ones that are going to get the lowest rate loans. Yeah. And so through that rate process, they will continue to compound a competitive advantage. And, you know, the small farmer, the small business, the small anything will just completely get wiped out. Yes. And, you know, I think that's compounded by globalization factors, uh, again, because with the Internet, we can create uh, global forms of, uh, of um, arbitrage for environmental reasons, for labor standard reasons, for a whole host of reasons. And it's one of the reasons I think we have a lot of populism in the United States. There's been ex- very strong expressions of populism because this is People understand this intuitively. They feel it. Uh, they see it at the cash register. They see it uh-huh. with how their how, how who their employers are. Like uh-huh. what options? Like it used to be, you could work for a small business in a small town. Now there's a Walmart, and that's uh-huh. it. Right. Um, so people feel it and see it, and that that's expressing itself as political frustration. Um, so to me, the central problem is aggregation, and uh-huh. to me, the logical solution to aggregation 
is decentralization. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about decentralization, you get right to the technology we've been talking about this whole Mm -hmm. time. So to me, Bitcoin is the decentralization of monetary power. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that there are other networks that are going to grow that are going to decentralize a lot of other economic activities. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I'm most passionate about is seeing de-aggregation. And I believe um, in empowering the individual, that the individual has more capability, more the ability to exert their will fairly into the world in greater measure. Um, and that their systems are a level playing field where we can compete on our merits. So that, that's what I'm most passionate about. That's why I, I got into the space, because I believe um, that it's just like freedom of expression. It's freedom mm-hmm. of value expression. Interesting. Yeah. Well, so tell me, is this the fundamental incentive schematic here is that we have, you know, f- we throw this term around fiat a lot, but it, it's actually right to the heart of everything we've been talking about, right? A decree, right? I can just verbalize my will and make it manifest in the world. And that's done through threat of force, largely, either threat or threat of force or actual use of force. That is how fiat works. So is the underlying dynamic here that fiat drives centralization? Because we know it does it with wealth distribution, right? As we've said, those closest to the spigot benefit most. That's clearly uh, also reflected in corporate market capitalizations, right? Bigger companies get access to cheaper money. They buy back their own shares. Uh, while smaller competitors uh, suffer the fixed cost of regulation more intensely than larger competitors, let's say. And then I think we see it reflected in political or even geopolitical power as well, right? That's what the U.S. is. They sit at the top of that that hierarchy. Is that the golden thread connecting all of this uh, problem? Is it just fiat drive centralization and aggregation? Yeah, absolutely. I think so, because we've already kind of established in this conversation that it is the how, how you express will into the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you can control the mechanism upon how you express will into the world, then you can will anything. You can will right. success into the world um, and you can pick winners and losers mm-hmm. and you can pick your side to be the winner um, above all else as, to the detriment of everyone else and not have a level playing field. You don't need to compete if you can pick the winner. Um, so absolutely, yeah, I think that I mean, I, I don't think money is the root of all evil, mm-hmm. but I think money is the incentive upon which evil men or women um, mm-hmm. instantiate their will on others. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to have uh, uh, less evil, less um, un- un- unfair uh, uh, extensions of will, I'll define that as as evil, then, then we need to have money that uh, is immune to that that mm-hmm. it does not have a common spigot and, and that um, people are not compelled to, to use because it's that compelling that um, gives the people who are printing it the power. You know, it's that threat of force that if you don't use it, uh, uh, they'll be able to, to do something to you, right? That right. affects some evil on you. Yeah, so yeah, the Bitcoin as the decentralization of monetary power lets the individual immunize him or herself from the opinions of others, which is fucking great. I mean, that's the whole point, right? Like, again, <laughs> right. You want to maximize your ability to project willpower, but defend yourself against the willpower of others. That's the whole purpose of human cooperation, really. Um, so that makes a ton of sense to me. This has been some really useful framing. I want to ask you kind of just one last about one last area here. Um, Clearly, we're both bullish on Bitcoin. Uh, I reserve an opinion on other crypto assets. Like I hold 100% Bitcoin currently because I just, and here's the reason is I haven't seen an asset credibly cross the chasm to decentralization. Now, that is a real chasm because even Bitcoin started out as just an idea in a guy's mind, presumably a guy, we don't know, team, whatever. Um, so it was centralized in the mind of Satoshi before it became what it is today, this trillion dollar globally decentralized money. How do other crypto assets, or it doesn't have to be a crypto asset. How does any project, um, how do they cross that chasm? 
And how do you, do you quant, do you, are there quantifiable metrics that you consider in that analysis? Is it qualitative? Is it both? How do you see that? Hmm. Good question. Um, I, I, so I'm, I'm someone who I, I consider myself currency agnostic um, only because uh, I understand that I don't know everything. And therefore, uh, there's a possibility I could be wrong on any particular choice that I might make. It's like that analogy I gave you with the trains moving to this final destination. Um, they're all moving at different rates and the rate at which they're going to that destination, that golden city is, is it changes over time. Mm. So what I focus on is, like you said, is the purchasing power. Uh, I look at the value as what is my purchasing power? I can take a short view or I can take a long view. If I take a long view, then I'll ascribe more more uh, weight towards certain properties of a network. Uh, it might, like we talked about, um, the issuance rate, right? The inflationary rate, if at all. Um, the the rules of consensus for that network it, is that uh, compelling from a long term standpoint. Mm -hmm. But from a short term standpoint, as an opportunist, um, I might say, well, this network, for whatever reason, has a stronger narrative, um, and that might see more inflows of purchasing power, I'm gonna participate in this network. Um, and the fact that I have the ability to switch between networks near zero switching costs means that I can play the game. If if uh, if I make a mistake, that's on me. Um, and the error is mine only, right? In other words, I, I chose this network, I decided to participate in it. It could be the dollar, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if we get a risk off situation like we saw in March of, uh, of 2020 with Bitcoin, the right move would be to have, uh, if you can time it, keyword, mm -hmm. the right move would have been, hey, sell all your Bitcoin and then buy at the bottom to double it, right? Mm -hmm. With altcoins, the right move might be, um, you know, if you have a long view on Bitcoin is, if altcoins outperform Bitcoin in the short term, you can play with fire and get into altcoins and ride that train for as long as it's going to ride at that rate mm -hmm. uh, to accumulate more Bitcoin. And a lot of People who've been in the space long enough know that over time, only the biggest, healthiest networks continue to grow. And all these small ones kind of fizzle, uh, you know, rise up. They, they're almost like fireflies. They, they, they rise up, they burn bright, and then they fizzle and die. Mm -hmm. So that's a game that you can play because the switching costs are so low and it's so easy to move in and out of positions. And a lot of pragmatic people, they do that and, and they get a lot of heat from it, you know, because... Mm -hmm. um, they're prioritizing maybe a shorter time frame than a longer time frame. I, I'm just I'm currency agnostic because, like I said earlier, I don't know who the winner might be, but I respect Bitcoin's ability to aggregate value over the long term. It's the longest, most proven asset mm -hmm. in the digital asset space. There is no question that it's seeing the most institutional adoption, uh, nation state adoption. Mm -hmm. It is it is clearly. Um, it's never going to go away. I think we've established that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as a pragmatist, I would say if I really want to uh, maximize my my both my and my family's purchasing power and ex ability to exert their will into the world, um, that needs to be a meaningful consideration. I need to think, okay, how do I accumulate uh, as much Bitcoin as I can over time? Mm. I but you know, but that doesn't preclude me from saying. Right now, this is the fastest train. I might be in dollars. I might mm -hmm. be in some other digital asset. Mm -hmm. um, and what I what I do to evaluate that, and I don't recommend this for everybody mm -hmm. because most people will get burned playing that game. Mm -hmm. But if you are going to play that game, you need to be uh, paying very close attention to the narratives that drive those flows, those gradients that we talked about. Those gradients are driven by a lot of narratives and the narratives are what convince people to take action and say, you know what, I'm gonna get into this. And we saw some crazy action this week where we're talk filming here in uh, October of 2021 mm -hmm. with things like Doge and Shiba coin and insane mm -hmm. kind of appreciations. Those send out these narrative signals to the world that, oh, wow, this is the fastest train. Mm -hmm. People who've been in this space for a while realize that that's typically a rug pull and mm -hmm. you're going to go in there and someone's just going to pull the rug out. Mm -hmm. um, so Bitcoin has a lot of properties that I think other digital assets to bridge that chasm don't have and won't have for probably a long time. Mm -hmm. Liquidity, time in market, the properties of the network that uh, that we talked about that compel people to stay in it. 
Mm-hmm. All of these things are so powerful narrative wise. The best story or, or you know, the, the convenient lie we tell, it's so compelling. You, you would be remiss to ignore that and, and not pay. And I think that's what we're seeing with the biggest investors now mm-hmm. is they understand that. They understand that probably better than anyone. Um, and they're probably getting into these positions a lot bigger than they're even telling anybody. Because mm-hmm. why would you tell somebody you're going to take a big position before you take your position first? Right. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're in. I think there's a lot more activity under the hood than what's being seen. Yeah, agreed. Because the incentive is to build your position before you announce if you're, you know, if you think that would have a, an impact on market cap. So that's mm-hmm. all right. That's that's interesting. So you're. I mean, this active manage. This is a very actively managed strategy, clearly, and there's mm-hmm. all these elements of timing and even luck to to some extent. So, I agree with you on that. It can be done, but it's not appropriate appropriate for like ninety nine percent of people. Absolutely agree. I agree. Know? So, I hope that's the message people don't take is yeah. please don't don't think that you're going to hop back and forth and and optimize. There are algorithms out there doing that a thousand times faster than you. Yeah, measuring sentiment and all these very complicated factors, you have no chance if uh, if you think uh, uh, you know you know something the market doesn't know. Yeah. So yeah, definitely not advocating that. But yes. that's that's how I view my position pragmatically, um, and I, I look at it more from an investment standpoint than from a speculator standpoint. I try right. not to speculate, but I do try to invest to outperform. So you're absolutely right. It's more mm-hmm. of an active management strategy. Yes. Yes. And yeah key wisdom there to always be humble in the face of the market because over the long run, the market's always going to be right more than you are. Right. Like I said, I mean, it's um, my definition. That's what it is. Yes, exactly. It's collective intelligence. Um, so then do you think in general, I, I also in the long run, I guess that crypto asset an individual crypto assets market cap would more or less track to its decentralization over time. Um, no, no, because we see a lot of centralized assets acquire a lot of liquidity yeah, um, and grow with respect to its network effects and not decentralization. Mm. And it's a frustrating property. I find that particularly frustrating because I feel if it were based on the values I hold, it mm. should uh, track with decentralization because I, mm. I put a lot of value on that property. Yeah, but um, a lot of people don't seem to care. Probably because they the way they entered the space wasn't maybe the way you and I entered the space. It wasn't through a realization of the kind of failures of centralization. It was mm-hmm. through some speculative function. You know, they mm-hmm. saw money, and they're like, "Oh wow, this is a great way to get in." And mm-hmm. admittedly, that's how I came into the space. I I saw, oh my goodness, I can make a, a lot of money uh, buying these things, um, but. As I went down the rabbit hole, what, what I really latched onto were these values of decentralization as being one of the ways that we could ameliorate some of these evils, yeah. some of these aggregating powers. Um, so, but but unfortunately, I, I just don't think most people assign as much value to that as I do, and that that's mm-hmm. frustrating to me. So, mm-hmm. the best I can do is communicate that to as many people as I can, in the hopes that they do assign that value to that property. Uh, and the the flows between the networks going yeah. the right way. That, that's the best we can do. Yeah, yeah, I agreed. And this is just a big open question in my mind is like, will distributed consensus technology, if that's the rubric we're putting all this under, it's got a lot of different names. Will it have another market proven use case besides cash, besides money, which Bitcoin, I would argue it has proven itself. Um Given its, you know, it's all its history, its size, the near, it's the most compelling narrative by far, in my opinion. Um, you know, the separation of money and state, which I think is the most compel- one of the most compelling narratives in human history, actually. Um, so, but I don't want you know. There's this old saying that a free mind never concludes. I also don't agree with this absolute dogmatic view of toxic Bitcoin maximalists that said, this is it, the answer, it's all there ever will be, the end. I think that it shuts, it's a, it's a closed mindedness, frankly. I don't know. I don't know enough to say if something else will succeed or not. That's why I'm asking, like, how do we quantify this? How do we measure this? How do we determine? Um, 
Balaji, I've been talking to Balaji. He's got a lot of great thoughts on it. Uh, he wrote a piece in 2017 about quantifying decentralization using yep. a uh, a model that's similar to the Gini coefficient, which mm-hmm. um, is interesting. Read so. that. That's a brilliant, brilliant um, writing. My, one of my favorite of, of his. It's fantastic. Yeah. Because yeah. it is decentralization as a word is very ambiguous. And he tried to provide some clarity to it and and break it down into different categories of decentralization. And 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 I think different people value different kinds of decentralization. Maybe decentralization of who owns the assets. Yes. Uh, decentralization of how consensus is arrived at. Mm-hmm. Um, decentralization of shared state, like nodes. If you mm-hmm. hold a historical record, there's so many aspects that are are super important. Uh, and it's funny because a lot of these alternative networks um, b- t- tend to bias one versus the other. Mm-hmm. So either the distribution mechanism is highly concentrated or the consensus me- mechanism is highly concentrated mm-hmm. in favor of like high throughput. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot of properties that they'll kind of take away from one to give to the other because yes. there's this you know, you know, security triangle. Um, and I think that that's what people are trying to figure out is what mm-hmm. is the optimum uh, and I'll just wait for the market to sort that out. And it could be a while. Uh, mm-hmm. I think we're really early. It could yeah. be a long time. I think to answer your question on what other maybe big use case um, versus just money, I think property rights is a huge use case. Um, I think um, I don't like NFTs. Mm-hmm. I don't like the idea of a JPEG and assigning something. But what I do recognize is that property rights be in the physical world expressed through a blockchain or a decentralized consensus is very powerful uh, mm-hmm. precisely because it's no longer subject to a government. Mm-hmm. It, in other words, if I sell my house, I got to take I got to get the title transferred from me to the new owner through my town. I'm implicitly yeah. relying on the government. Yeah. And if I owe some taxes, Guess what? That transaction is not going through. So that's mm-hmm. just is equally compulsory uh, through the threat of violence. Um, I would like to see property rights themselves expressed um, on chain for physical things. I, I don't know how we get there from here, um, but that's what I see is the long view is maybe something that's possible. Yeah, I, I too am a huge proponent of that. Just removing the arbitrariness from property rights, frankly, that's a huge benefit to everyone. But to your point, it's like, how the hell do we get there? Because the state will not give that up willingly. So my general view on this right now is that Bitcoin needs to really cement itself. I don't, and I don't know where this number is. Maybe it's a $10 trillion, $20 trillion market cap, where it's really, again, these flows out of fiat complex into Bitcoin are significant enough to where the state is kind of like shedding functions. You know, it's privatizing lands, privatizing property rights, things like this, then it will be opened up to experimentation with, with technologies of this variety. That could be a long time. I don't know how long that takes. So I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, I, I do have to run. I apologize. Yeah. Um, yeah. But- Please. If you just tell my audience where they can find you. Um, yeah. I appreciate you doing this. Uh, yeah. So uh, where can you find me? Uh, I do a lot of interviews on real vision. I, I encourage you to check that out um, on my Twitter uh, I don't know what my Twitter account is. Uh, I, let's see. I, I think I've got it right here. It's some here. strange. Yeah. I'll, I'll at, re- okay. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> at S A N T I A G seven eight seven five eight three two seven. I should turn that into a hash or something because it's like I don't even know my own Twitter handle. Uh, it's, <laughs> that was that was assigned that by Twitter uh, long ago. Uh, and I don't really know how to change it, and it's too late now. Um, but yes, I, I love engaging people on Twitter um, and on 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 Real Vision, um, and you know anyone can reach out to me. I, I love to to talk to people online and, and over DM or or publicly. Um, and you know, Robert, thank you so much for having me on. I just I love this conversation. You're you're one of my uh, thought leaders, so. I appreciate it. And this is an awesome conversation. I think you've just become one of my thought leaders as well. So thank you so much. I'll (laughs) link to everything in the show notes so people don't have to memorize your complicated Twitter handle. (laughs) (laughs) 